Next plenary speaker today is um, Gareth Murphy. Gareth is a data steward at Novo Nordisk and has a distinguished Pitapalooza history, having given a fantastic his, um, keynote in Dublin um, two years ago. Um, so we're thrilled to welcome him back this year. Um, Gareth's going to talk to us about pre-competitive PIDs and um, the journey to fair data. So Gareth, I will get off and give you the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was a very kind introduction, yes. Yeah, so um, when last I was at Pitapalooza, I was working in a, a neutron facility, so more at the atomic physics end of things. And now I'm, I have since moved to a, a new organization, uh, Novo Nordisk. Um, and so that's more on the life science end of things. So I'm seeing more more lab, lab scientists work, working with test tubes and graduated centers since, that I have since um, since in university. So it's a, it's a bit of a change for me, but also analysts working with uh, modeling the um, uh, large molecules and um, analyzing the data as well, which is um, some of our main stakeholders as a data steward in, in Open Orders. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so just for those of you who don't know this organization, it's a, it's a pharma company making healthcare products and medicines and pens for people who have uh, various chronic diseases, such as, for example, um, diabetes, which is, um, has been our, our, the core business for a few hundred years, and um, hemophilia and growth, growth disorders and um, obesity as well, which is becoming a, a, a new area. And so and the idea is to, to um, that we, we have a, a large amount of data on, in the area, which and partly because we have been in operation for almost 100 years, we're coming up to the 100th anniversary, and a lot of the data is in a kind of historical format as well. So we want to kind of um, be able to search and make our data more findable and more accessible. And it's a, a relatively large organization. There's um, about 40,000 employees um, uh, and they're scattered around the world in China, in Denmark, India, UK, US. We also have sites in Brazil and, and France as well. So that's it. And we're hiring as well. So, so we have um, needs for people in, in these different locations if you're thinking of making um, yes, and we, we supply about 50% um, uh, of the world's insulin, uh, which is for, for um, largely for people suffering from um, the uh, various types of diabetes. And, um, and there's about 30 million people using these, these type of products. So there's a, a large amount of data out there. And not all of these people are using, um, uh, for example, um, wearable devices to, to, to track their, their um, either their, their heart rate or the glucose level, but, what, but as more and more people start to use these devices, more information becomes available. So it becomes like a kind of a data management problem, I guess. And, and with regard to having identifiers for the diseases, for the, for the main variants of diabetes, for example, there are of course persistent identifiers um, which you can access, but for the more rare conditions, as we saw from the earlier talk by um, Melissa, um, there are not always um, persistent identifiers available for those uh, diseases. So we, we need a, we have a, a large need for persistent identifiers. Um, yes. So um, so that's a little bit about Novo Nordisk. And I think uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the drug development pipeline. Uh, and this is something that we see a lot in the media at the moment, I guess, ranging from um, sort of heroic depictions of the drug development pipeline to um, to monstrously uh, <laughs> not heroic depictions of the, the pipeline. But there is this process, and this slide, as you can see, is probably a little bit out of date because we uh, typically screen about 10,000 candidate drugs, and we take about five to eight years to do this. Uh, so it's quite a long process, and that's the preclinical stage. And then we go to clinical trials, um, and you've seen, of course, in the media, the phase one trials, phase two, and phase three trials, each taking one to two years, two to three years, and three to four years. And as this process goes on, um, the, the drugs are being um, basically tried out on more, more and more people, increasing numbers of people. At the same time, the number of drugs is decreasing. So it's a kind of a, um, a, a, kind of a knockout tournament, uh, the equivalent of Jeopardy that we had yesterday, if you like. So we kind of reduce from the 10,000 to, um, to, the, to the 50 to 15, and then, then finally to the one super qualifier or the lead candidate, which can be then uh, hopefully a given out. Um, and so this, this long process, which could last 30 years, has been telescoped a bit in recent times by the people working on the COVID vaccine. So I should say, um, you know, enormous amounts of data are generated over a long time, but also very short timelines when there's a pandemic about. And we also need persistent identifiers. And I, I, I mentioned persistent identifiers for the conditions, but we also need persistent identifiers clearly for the drugs, uh, for the drug candidates. We need them for the experiments that people do. Uh, is it, I kind of a microscope there, but um, 
we don't only use microscopes as instruments, so we have many different types of instruments, so we need these instrumental pits as well in order to be able to identify who's doing what experiment with what. And when there's a large amount of people working in parallel, it's kind of like an army and you need to um, ensure that there isn't um, an awful lot of, of duplication. So, so there's a big need, as, as you know, and as, as people in the life sciences are already familiar, I think there's a big need for persistent identifiers here. So, and this is a, an area which has been in, in, this, in this state of flux um, uh, rapidly, um, and timelines are getting a lot shorter, and you can see this in the New York Times or in the media of your choice. You can see the corona vaccine tracker, and you can see a bit of this process of, you probably don't see the 10,000 uh, compounds, but you see the uh, initial number going to phase two trials and phase three trials, and um, and, um, and the vaccines are, are um, limited and they're approved, and, and they're abandoned if they don't work. So there is this, um, kind of a hard, uh, hard limit on, on how, how to produce. And after all this, then we go into production, which is now what we're going to hear about in the media for the next uh, uh, period. And obviously it can be very difficult to produce these on a, on a short time. And the diagram here is a little bit inaccurate because it sort of shows these, these pills and, and powders in, in pill form, but of course they don't start in pill form. They start in, in a sort of, often in a diagram form on the blackboard and they end up in the pill form here. So getting, getting, from, getting from the lab well, getting from the blackboard or, or the whiteboard to the lab to the pill is a, is a bit of a process, <laughs> and it's 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 a difficult process. And I myself am a, a little new to the area as well. So um, yes, it's but it's a it's a bit more complicated in some ways than uh, new, neutron um, neutron reactions. Yes, but we, we do feel this time pressure, and we do we we do need to, to invest a bit more in our paid infrastructure. And uh, if that wasn't all, then there's a sort of increase in the number of um, uh, data in the number of bytes uh, of, of data available. So in my last talk in 2019, it was, the title was PIDs and petabytes and neutrons. And now the numbers for health data is of course uh, much larger. So the life sciences data be between the wearable um, devices you have tracking your heart rate, which you, 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 um, you sort of gathering more and more data points and more time series every day. And um, yeah, and uh, then of course the um, people are self-administering drugs with, with pens, and those can also be um, be uh, updating their, their dosage to the cloud, for example. For that. So we have increasing amounts of health data from drug trials, also from non-interventional -interve studies, which are kind of a newer area for drug trials. And so there's a lot of health data which is just appearing and being churned out by people doing sequencing and sequencing the human genome. And yes, and obviously there's no turning back the time, and we can't ask people to go back to using clockwork watches uh, just because it's a, a data management problem. So we need to actually track this data a little bit more. And there's a, a kind of a, a, an article, or I don't know what you call it, a listicle by, by Marcus Banks about the size of big data. And the estimate here is for 2020 and now we're in 2021. So we probably need to do a bit of an update, but for yet. Yeah, so greater than 2000 or 2300 exabytes of health data by 2021. And some of this may not, um, may not be able to store it or retain it. We may just have to kind of, um, um, figure out a better storage solution or, or um, so, something like that, or put some put some pressure on the vendors to, to make a, a faster search engine. But yes, that's it. But yeah, then it's fine to have all this data and it's fine to have um, a, a large amount of data, which at least you can mine and do machine learning on. But then we have the problem of unstructured uh, medical data. So, um, and this is, uh, there are many examples of unstructured data. I think people think of the doctor's prescription and, and the, um, and the um, and the doctor's report on and the, the diagnosis as well. But you're also talking about lab, lab reports, as we all know, if you're in the lab. Or maybe you don't know if you're not in the lab, but people tend to write it up in a kind of a narrative form. And often um, the, um, the, the notebooks themselves don't have an easy way of structuring the data. So people tend to make these kind of tables. Um, uh, you know, they make a, a text table and they put some numbers in there and it stays there in the middle of a kind of a kind of a word document type structure. So then that can be hard to mine that for information because you need to pull it out and and, um, and kind of recognize the contents of the columns and the units and all this and um, and it becomes more difficult. So it'd be nice to be have a better a better structure for our metadata if possible. And this involves um, um, obviously our, um, part of the process is creating persistent identifiers for the different things like the methods the sub varieties of methods, the different uh, drugs and compounds that we use and the different conditions that we're trying to treat. Anyway, so that's just a little uh, more about the challenges, I guess, than about the uh, the solutions to the problem. And so part of, and and so, so and then once we have, um, if we are able to label the um, the uh, the data earlier in the, in the research process, so uh, when, when we go out to, um, to the, um, 
the kind of production stage and handing out the patients, we obviously have to label the, the uh, medicine correctly and make sure that it treats the right condition and it doesn't advertise anything that is not on, um, that it doesn't do. I mean, obviously, if people are going around saying it does something it doesn't do, it's, it's not very helpful, but the label has to be at least very clear on what, what the, 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 um, the medication can or can't do. But it's also nice to do this earlier in the process as well, actually when we develop the, the drug. So if we can connect the early research and um, uh, documentation, structuring of the metadata and the information with the drug, then we could have a, a bit faster processing and a bit faster way of delivering um, uh, drug, drugs to patients um, while still going through the clinical pot trial process. Yes. So I probably don't need to explain to the PID audience uh, what is fair data, but um, we hear of it, a lot of it in the context of public data and open science as well. But on the other side as well, in, in the industrial level, there's also a, a huge interest in um, in fair data, which I don't know if that's a surprise to you um, or, or, or some of you. It was, it was definitely a surprise to me having worked on the public side to see there was so much interest in, in making the, the private sector data more findable. So there you, your, your findability is a little different. You want to be able to find it on the intranet rather than on the internet. Um, exactly, exactly. But you also want people to be able to access the data and have access to both the public data sets, the, the, um, the bought-in data sets, and the um, kind of in-house um, and um, clinical research organization generated data sets. So you need to have findability and accessibility of all this data. And this saves people basically doing the experiments again and again, which is also a possibility. If you have the lab equipment right there, it can be sometimes tempting to just um, run the experiment again if you can't find the data. But if we keep doing this, uh, it's going to slow down um, our drug uh, production possibilities a lot. And then for interoperability, I don't know if you've seen the Bioformats web website, for example, you can see there's 150 different uh, formats in, in, uh, listed there for all the different bio information. So it would be nice and part of our goal is to have just one format uh, for each of the, for all of the instruments. So each instrument can write into a shared format. And so this would in improve the interoperability and would mean that we have an easier time uh, re reading. But it's also a complex problem because different instruments make different measurements. So we need to, um, we need to kind of uh, choose the right format and make sure that we can describe all the different bits of metadata. And it's something I have, had, have also had experience in with the um, neutron and, um, and x-ray data, for example, and there we have tried to, um, to um, connect the neutron and x-ray and laser institutes together and produce a single common format uh, for neutron and x-ray data, which is, is different data, but it's not so different that we can't describe it using a kind of a, a single envelope format. So that format is called Nexus, for example. And, uh, and, then, and I guess on the other side, if you're looking up a bit, the astronomers also tend to use common data formats. Traditionally, they use the, the FITS format for interchanging spectra and images. But, um, and that was um, basically because you had NASA kind of pushing, pushing that format out to the community. So similarly, we also need to, in the life sciences, I think there's a strong need for this kind of interoperable format. And the goal is then to make all this data a little bit more um, reusable so we can use the metadata both for us um, as humans and our fellow human beings who want to, our fellow data analysts and our fellow experimenters, but also for the robotic side, the artificial intelligence and machine learning aspect. They also need to be able to um, um, automatically recognize it because uh, humans can obviously recognize the type of uh, misprints that we saw in Nicole's session. Um, Nicole, you know, just by showing her that word, she could recognize the type of, I probably could not. But the machine learning things would, would, would just, you know, they would just throw it away and they wouldn't always um, always be able to recognize this. So it's important that we kind of label stuff, label correctly, test and validate the labels and have this notion that there's this um, artificial intelligence, which is is not always the most um, in intelligent, I guess, process, which will be looking at it. So um, so there's a kind of a, a, a kind of a business imperative to do this as well as a kind of um, um, just just in general in terms of accuracy and um, and data standards. So that's it. And there's some, and this is kind of a, from a paper in, in drug discovery today. And this is um, uh, an article about uh, trying to relate um, how how fair how the principles of fair data and more findable data and precision identifiers can feed into having a, a better and faster um, drug development process. This was obviously written before COVID. <laughs> so I think you know people are now turning to this kind of example to say, well, how can we how can we get things a little bit faster? Obviously in the lab, we have processes which take a certain time and speeding up work in the lab can be done by automation, but we don't want to reduce quality. But on the digital side in general, we don't, um, we don't, um, we don't experience so much quality reduction by, um, by, uh, by <laughs> speeding the, the processes up, I guess. So yeah, so this is and the idea of, of trying to use fair data um, to make our, our 
our silos of data a bit more accessible and a bit more readable for people. Yeah. So and you can go and read the article and the um, the DOI is there as well, if you if you want. So and what what would this mean? Would be this would mean by by um by taking the data a little bit out of the lab. We have a lot of experts in the lab, people with a lot of experience on these experiment on these experiments. They can look at these samples. They can make a diagnosis and so forth. The clinicians can look at the clinical data and, and diagnose. But we also need to label our data correctly. And so for example, for conditions like um. Uh, if we show on the right here, there's a condition called diabetic retinopathy, which you can get in your eye. Because diabetes can also affect your vision. You can experience hemorrhages. You can experience microaneurysms in your eye. And so, um, you know, if we happen to have a, a lot of data, in this particular case, it's um, it's a competing organi organization which has this particular data set. But I still feel we could use this as an, as an example. Um, but um, and so there, we can also have clinicians sit down and say, okay, this belongs to this and this belongs to that. But we can also use machine learning algorithms to match and to label the data here. So you can see if the, the retinopathy condition is absent or if it becomes moderate or severe or, or chronic or, or whatever. And so this is um, just an example of um, the type of applications we'd, we'd, we'd like to be able to apply to our um, data uh, information. So that's it. And part of this is being able to make our data more fair and more accessible and being able to describe each part of the data set and each part of the instrumental data um, accurately and in particular using persistent identifiers and ontologies. So this is a uh, part of the goal. And as I say, it's a journey, so we're not really there yet, um, but we have to always uh, take it in steps. So, so what is the, the first step? The first step is to, I guess, assess how fair is our data already? How easy is it to find? And so you've probably seen that there are a lot of different ways of making this fair assessment, this fair share and so forth. And so we need to kind of look internally and say, well, how far fair is our data here? So here we've, we have had to um, sort of excise a bit the particular department names to protect the, um, the innocent or the guilty as, as the case may be. But um, um, we do this kind of assessment and we look and we go ahead and we talk to the users and we ask them, um, um, how fair is your data and what type of PID are you using um, in particular on your, for, your, um, for your data? So, um, and of course, the normal response to, to people when you ask them what type of PID are you using, they say, I don't really know what a PID is, so you have to tell me what a PID is, <laughs> and then I can tell you if I'm using it or not. And so there's a kind of a low recognition factor for PIDs, but it's also a good metric to know um, how, um, <laughs> oh, thank you, Keith. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so it, but it's also a good metric to know, um, to know how, um, how fair our data is, how many persistent identifiers people are using. And for example, if you go on, on, on um, ORCID and you can search for Nova Nordisk, and I was trying this the other day and seeing how many of us have ORCIDs or not. So this is something we should kind of know in a way. And I got about 2,000 hits on ORCID. So now I'm thinking I need to make maybe more training on how to use the ORCID search engine to see if this is the right number or if it's too 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 low or, or too high. But we do need to, to, to track how many of our researchers are publishing using um, um, ORCIDs and using DOIs and also how much how much data they're getting and how much are also we're using persistent identifiers internally and externally, both for the external public uh, data sets that people are gathering um, and also the internal data sets that people create in the lab. Um, yes. So um, yeah, and so I have a I made a poll a bit on the, on the challenges of, of using PIDs. So I don't know if we can, um, oh, I can just see, um, well, anyway. Um, oh yeah, so um, okay. Well, anyway, we can we can um, it, maybe it's below um, Nicole's poll. Uh, ah, okay. So yeah, I think maybe you have to scroll down to the end of the, of the poll to see. So we we were asking users a little bit about how you're using PIDs in your community. So I think if you click on the polls button and scroll down to the bottom, for example, we see users kind of doing a lot of what I call. I guess this is my entry in the in the pun competition, but decapitation. Um, so, so, uh, so which is. You know, people want to shorten it. My orchid is very long. I think I'll just shorten it to make it easier to use and remember. So uh, they just cut off the last three digits or the first three digits. Um, um, yes. And then um, we also see people joining PIDs together. So they say, well, I need a new PID. And the best thing to do is take two PIDs, like so my orchid and my DOI, and just join them together to make a bigger and better PID. And so this is something that we see um, a bit of in, in, um, in the community as well. And then we also see um, uh, people um, kind of also doing this bit of Bit of pit branding, so um, <laughs> so uh, I have, haven't seen pelvic inflammatory disease come up yet. But, um, I'm sorry, that was just a question from the from the comments. 
but people are putting their name and their organization to pit and they say, but you know, often, you know, you know, there's this persistent element and people then move projects and they move, but the name stays there and still persistent, you know, and maybe we need a retro pit or something that we can say this, this name needs to be retrospectively assigned to someone else and maybe we need to change the branding slightly. And in particular for instrument names, people often like to, to have an instrument and they say, well, I, I want to put my instrument name in the pit if the data is coming from these instruments. And uh, of course, that's good as well. But then you get you know, more funding. You make a new, or you rename your instrument after some organization. Or you, you rename it from you know, instrument to super instrument or mega instrument. <laughs> and then, of course, your PID branding kind of becomes a little bit outdated. Then, so it can be a bit. Uh, it can cause difficulties. And also, then people say, "Oh, would you mind changing my PID?" You know. So yeah, it's a bit. You know, it's a bit um, like the uh, the story of um, this actor, you know, having. Um, um, this actor uh, called Johnny Depp having the act, the, t the tattoo of you know, um, you know Winona forever on his chest, you know. But then sometimes the things are not forever, and then, and then we need to change the branding a little bit. And so now I think he's scripted a little ad now. It just says Wino forever. Um, at least that's what they say. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> Dancing on ice for DOI. <laughs> cool. But um, yes. So. Um, so yeah, so this is um, so this is something that just comes up, and I just wondered if if people are also experiencing this in the community. So I thought I would throw throw it out just to ask you a little bit about. It. Yeah, so this is kind of our, our fair assessment, and following on the fair assessment, um, we want to go and do, take it to the next stage. So uh, the slide is also a little bit uh, redacted, um, but we have um, we, what we want to do is say at what stages of the data process do we use which metadata and where, and we can identify these kind of red areas, and they're often around the decision areas when we have to decide what we want to do in the next stage of the process based on a particular set of uh, metadata. And often, I mean, there was the example for COVID testing where people say, well, I can't um, you know, send out this test without an authorization, which I get by email. So then you have this 24-hour wait for the email approval to send out the test because obviously you can't just send someone what's potentially the wrong test. And so this was slowing down um, in, in Denmark, for example, and I don't know how it is in other countries, the COVID testing process. And what people said is actually we could we could replace this with a kind of a mobile you know, approval or something like that, which people can do more quickly, or we can sort of automate the approval a little bit. Um, yes. Um, yeah, so what we want to do is identify the places in the data pipeline where we have the most data, where we need extra PIDs, and add them to the to the pipeline, and so that's a little bit of this. It would be perhaps clearer with the uh, the text, which um, unfortunately, for various reasons, I have to leave out in this slide. But I hope you'll forgive me. Um, yes. So um, and then the idea is to um, um, we in, um, in in our company or in, in many pharma companies, it's kind of a competitive. Um, organization. And so uh, we don't always collaborate uh, necessarily, but we compete when it comes to drug development, I guess, um, which is something that we see a lot. We also have the opportunity to do some pre-competitive collaboration. So when there are areas that we think we don't really compete on, but we have a sort of joint challenge, um, you know, particularly, you know, when it comes to instruments or, or, um, or some types of data analysis, then uh, competing companies can join together and develop solutions for problems. Um, that we have that are common to us all. And this would also can be done in an open way. So, um, and I know Katrina asked a question about the open infrastructure, but we can also share this with the, with the, um, the you know, the, the open community as well. And not just, it's not sort of um, something that we just develop in house and sort of swap around. So it's, it's more convenient and, and easier to use the existing open in infrastructures. For example, uh, there's a foundation which is called the Allotrope Foundation, I suppose um, a little bit geared towards the chemical um, end of things, and, but it's a framework for storing scientific metadata. And in particular, I mean, they have various solutions, but one of them is to look at making uh, a new data form which describes data from all the different um, instruments on the market at the moment, the ones that you could buy, and possibly not the ones that you could build. And the idea is to have a data description in this format and then store all the data, the time series or whatever, in a data cube. And then this could be um, used on all the instruments. So the idea is to kind of um, convert all of the kind of uh, proprietary vendor format data into a kind of open uh, format that anyone can read. And so that that um, is a kind of a work in progress at the moment. But obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, we need to have identifiers um, for all of the different aspects of the different instruments. So if one instrument measures purity in one way, another instrument measures purity in another way, we like to have a persistent identifier that shows the purity using the current ontologies that we have um, in, that exist on, um, on BioPortal and so forth. But also we need to enrich these ontologies as the newer instruments come online, they, they measure more complex things which are not always reflected in the, um, in the public ontologies um, which can reflect the more traditional instruments. 
Um, yes. So, so, um, so this is the idea of having this um, this common format. So something's come up before in the various fields, and maybe you'll probably hear more about it either at this meeting or, or others. But I think it's um, um would be very useful both for the um, both for the public sector, but also for the private sector um, for us as well. So this is a little bit, and so we can join together with both public organizations and private organizations and develop these shared open formats via persistent identifiers. Um, yes, and there's a website, and I did not include the link, but I think it's allotrope.org, and I can add it to the chat as well. So, and just to have some short conclusions that FAIR data is uh, becoming uh, increasingly important. Um, it's increasingly important to us all, but also on the industrial side, and so I thought it, you might be interested in hearing a bit of news from there. And in particular, Nova Nordisk, we want to continue to use fair data methods in order to speed up the drug development um, processes. And I should also mention that we are also currently hiring. Uh, so if you do, um, uh, if, and particularly ontologists and um, data stewards and data curators, but also just in general, if, um, if you're doing anything that you think would be interesting for us. And I think all of the things at this stage are on LinkedIn, so you can just look on LinkedIn. But yes, it's just something we'd like to mention as well. And then I will. Um, I will I will just uh, stop here and um, maybe we can discuss the poll and yes and, and thank you um, thank you Rachel Excellent. and thank you for listening so yes cool thanks um, thanks Gareth so um, I think you I think you sort of answered Katrina's question a little bit in about the um, yeah. So, so well, I, well, I just, I just um, read it out because maybe people didn't see. Yeah, it. that'd be great. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. The question is, do you think that the pharma industry will also support open PIDs and metadata and help to work with a uh, publicly funded um, research community to develop uh, community norms and stuff? So that's the. Um, so currently, I think that is underway both in the current Allotrope Foundation but also in the Pistoia Alliance. Um, so there's at least two I can think of off the top of my head, um, and obviously, I think um, um, the more organisations. <laughs> Uh, that are in it the better and um, i think it's helpful and and it's also um you know i mean it's it's one of the things that the COVID crisis made apparent is that if we work together both on the public side and the private side we can arrive at solutions more quickly um so i think that's um that's something that um yeah that that um we could we could yes and then so, and then in terms of your pool as you said the um the the, the not much decapit Decap I, I don't know if I can do it. Um, <laughs> bit of PID hybrid hybridization and but PID, PID branding was a uh, PID branding was definitely a, a, a strong favorite in terms of things that we see. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think I've, I've also probably probably we do see something similar. So it's interesting the community this, is, this also reflects my experience. So um, the more decapitators is, is kind of a, a newer thing, but um, yeah. So um, yeah, but it's it's, it's interesting seeing how we can kind of maybe encourage people to think about bids in a different way and um, also, you know, have a, a more, um, as uh, Nicole was highlighting, if we can just have a, a more kind of drag and drop process instead of retyping, sometimes that helps people to, to use them more, more effectively. Yes, but yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I do think, as you said, I think the tools, et cetera, play a part. Um, and is it even like extraction techniques and things like that? It, you know, it, even with the best will in the world, when they're trying to streamline workflows, sometimes add in things. I'm going to sneak in one question from um, from Keys um, just before we finish, um, which is how do you tackle PID generation at Novo Nordisk? Um, yeah, so I mean, we have, uh, we, we have a lot of discussion suggestions about that issue but there's that uh, there's so many different approaches I guess and some people want to use more like random opaque identifiers um, um, but actually it tends to be less people want to use random opaque identifiers and more people want to use them for example sequential identifiers and things and I think people like to stick with the traditional kind of PID structure of having um, having um, kind of a prefix uh, which which denotes where it's from and also then this kind of string of numbers after. But then there's a lot of opinions about su substructures as well. So it's, it's not really a solved problem. So I have to look at, at your link keys to answer more. But yeah, so we, we, I, I don't know if I can have a, a particularly direct answer to that, but we would, we would like to, um, part of the process is having a kind of a common PID, uh, a common minter, minter to, to, um, to, so that people can mint PIDs and then agreeing on what people think of as a reasonable format. Is um is another one, and we also like to kind of draw on the the public PIDs are already there, and so then try and follow the um the the PID um standards that people use. So if it's a chemical PID and KB is the main ontology, we should use a KB style 
paid, for example. Um, that's uh, that's it. Yes, Todd, I see your point about the semantics. Yes, that, that is also um, that is also a huge a huge factor. So people are, are also um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let's. I think I'm afraid we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to wrap up there. We definitely triggered some discussion about um, about paid best practice. Um, mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank Gareth for joining us. Um, so, if again, if you could join me in a bit of a virtual round of applause for Gareth, that would be that would be superb. Um, but thanks, thanks again. Thank you.